welcome to Dangerous Wisdom, a journey into mystery and a gateway to the mind of nature and the nature of mind. This is Dr. Nikos, your friendly neighborhood soul doctor, happy to be here with you so that together we can create a culture of wisdom, love, and beauty. Auspicious interbeing to you and yours, my friends, and Coenos Hermes, uh, much praise to Sophia as well. Always, Sophia is here with us, Philosophia. And we have a great avatar of Sophia joining us today, a delightful, delightful person, Mary Reynolds. I'm very excited about this. I tried to get Mary Reynolds for some time. And uh, finally, we managed to get it to work. And let me tell you about Mary if you don't know about her. This, this particular episode is going to resonate with several others that we've done. Certainly going to resonate with the one we did uh, by uh, with Doug Talamy, that dialogue. But uh, so many other streams come together in, in this dialogue. And so let me tell you about Mary if you don't know about her. She's so awesome. She is a reformed international landscape designer who launched her career by achieving a gold medal for garden design at the Chelsea Flower Show in London in 2002. That's a really big deal. If you don't know about that, especially if you're for people here on Turtle Island, over there, the Chelsea Flower Show is a huge deal. And it was such a big deal, her particular victory, that they made a movie out of it. And the story of that is a movie called Dare to be Wild, which Mary does dare. She is a best-selling author of The Garden Awakening. I think Buddha would like that title because, you know, Buddha is that word. Buddha means awakened. And it might be better word than enlightenment. So it's almost like the garden enlightenment. Forget the old enlightenment that Steven Pinker likes to champion. Enlightenment now, no. Garden awakening now. I think that would be far better and would make the world a much better place. She also wrote a delightful book called We Are the Ark. And that's a super important concept that I, I think we'll touch on. She is an occasional television presenter and the founder of the global movement We Are the Ark. She's not the worst cook. So she says, I mean, how can I be sure? Uh, she likes to campaign against evil corporate political efforts to cut us all off, uh, cull us all off, actually. It's a good thing just when I put my spectacles on, to cull us all off with pesticides, herbicides, GMOs, greenwashing, and fossil fuel craziness. That's the least of it. There's even more insanity, but those are very important symptoms to fight against. Her aim in life is to restore the earth's native plant and creature communities her clothing of choice, and remind people that our role here on this beautiful home of ours is one of guardian, not gardener. And that's part of the revolution, the inner revolution that we're going to be talking about. Mary Reynolds, thank you, Wisdom Sister, for joining us. Welcome to Dangerous Wisdom. Thanks, Nikos. Nikos, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we were noting it's a delightful day where you are. Pretty nice here, too. A little bit of fog burning off right now because it's early here, but sunny in Ireland, huh? That's nice. Uh, it's been raining for seven years now. Yes. And <laughs> it's <laughs> like that. And um, yeah, we've had, we've had a torrential rain and flooding for the last few days. So it's actually just this moment in time the sun came out. So good timing. Yeah. Wow, that's synchronistic. That's the garden awakening at work. When Buddha woke up, he saw the morning star. And you <laughs> are seeing the star that's even closer than that. So that's a very yeah. good auspicious sign. Yeah, me and Buddha, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he would like it. I mean, that was the gold standard of, of epistemology in, in Buddhist philosophy. It still is, but for many years, you went into a wild place. That's what mm -hmm. Buddha did, right? He went and sat under that tree, and you're inviting us to bring that tree, that place back again. Buddha would say, where are your places for awakening? Of course, he would say, we can wake up anywhere. But since so many people in that, that tradition went into the wild places and became interwoven in their mystery and magic, and that was what supported their awakening in an important sense, then we need to bring those spaces back. I think that's part of what you're inviting us to do is kind of meet Buddha halfway, <laughs> bring the forest well, will you tell us about um, will you tell us about the We Are the Ark? And I will put it's easy to remember people. It's just wearethearc.org, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so look that up. That's the website about it. Tell us about the We Are the Ark project. It's beautiful. I love this. Sure. Um, well, in 2018, in the winter of 2018, I was sitting at my desk looking down over my lawn and I saw a fox run past and it was winter and daytime. 
is kind of unusual and two hares were chasing him, which is very unusual. And um, I kept watching the brambly wild patch he'd gone into. Um, and pretty soon uh, I noticed a little hedgehog running along um, in the same direction. And it reminded me of stories of, you know, Noah's Ark when I was a kid. And I thought it was very unusual that there must be something they're running away from. So I went outside and went in the opposite direction down my lane. I live in the country, countryside in, in Ireland. And at the end of my lane, the very, very small road, um, just enough for one car. But on the other side, there was this really beautiful thicket of a field filled with thorny plants. And it was completely impenetrable. It was like a native emergent woodland. It was all thorny trees and shrubs and foxgloves and all sorts of wonderful plants, but you couldn't get into it. But somebody had got planning permission to build a house at the top of the field and they'd gone in with a digger and they'd cleared it out within moments without any thought for all the creatures that called it home. And I stood there fairly horrified because I had done the same thing myself so many times. So that was the end of that career. And I went back inside with a cup of tea and I sat down and I read about the collapse of biodiversity and all around the world, how we're losing our true natures, you know, and, um, you know, I thought, well, where, where are our shared kin supposed to go? Like, you know, they, they can't go out into our agricultural land because, you know, it's poisoned with chemicals. There's no sanctuary there everything is reefed out you know and the water is polluted there's no safety there and they can't go into our woodlands generally um especially over here and a lot of places nowadays there's just crops there's monoculture stands of crops and people are mad into planting trees and carbons you know carbon offsetting and all this but what they're doing is planting non-native stands of commercial crops and it's not a solution and the only thing growing there really is you know, the trees which are non-native here, it's spruce, you know, and the only thing that's growing there is spruce and silence and darkness, really, and it doesn't support any life. And they can't go into our gardens because our gardens, we treat them like blank palettes for our creative pleasure, our little patches of this world. And there is no um, sanctuary there because the whole foundation of life is built upon native plant communities and our gardens are filled with non-native plants and sterile lawns and everything is controlled like a, like a, like a still life painting. And so there's no safety there. So I, I set up a movement called We Are The Ark um, because I called it We because I didn't want it to be me. It was for everybody to take on board. And the Ark stands for Acts of Restorative Kindness to the Earth so that nobody thinks it's related to any particular religion because it's not. It's about it's about the Earth. And um, so it's a very simple idea. I ask people to take just to share and to take half of any land they have under their care and to give it back and to restore a native plant community. And um, there's there's a little bit of work involved. It's not about letting it go because, you know, if you let it go, it'll just be out of balance. So you have to be the balance. You have to go in and carry out all the ecosystem services that, say, the wolf would do or the deers would, deer would do or, you know, depending on what part of the world you're in. And that sounds complicated, but all it means is creating layers, so layers of different types of habitat. And that works really well. And and then all the life lies in the edges. So depending on how much land you have, you might only have room for one layer or two layers. Um, but it like, so that means like bare earth, um, grazed areas, which you call lawn, but not like the monoculture plastic lawns you see these days, like working with the native herbs. And um, then you have an arc meadow, which again is not about fluffy, f colorful flowers. It's about the native herbs and and you have scrubby areas and then you have woodland and then you have all the, the stuff in between like water and um, dead wood and dry stone walls or just piles of stones or whatever whatever creature habitats and supports you can create. And almost overnight, um, the creatures to return and it's really magical. I mean, it's really magical. And all I ask people to do is to put up a sign saying this is an ark and they have to make it themselves. I'm not going to sell them anything. And underneath is the website, which put I've put together with a couple of friends of mine to um, 
um Jen and Claire and Joe and we've we've basically put I've put I've written all the words and put all these resources together so that people are completely supported to do what they need to do whether it's a school arc or garden arc or a farm arc or a commercial public land arc and so all this the resources are there and it's amazing what happens it actually restores hope because people realize how quickly nature recovers and the magic of it is that as the land recovers, you recover yourself. You, 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 because we're basically mirrors of the land, you know, the land draws us in. It's not like we go and find someplace. The land draws us in. And sometimes that can be, um, it's generally a reflection of us, you know, of where we are. And um, if you have even a window sill or, um, a balcony or a tiny little patch or a ranch or whatever you have if you and we we help people figure out how to work with even the tiniest spaces but as you restore your relationship with with our true nature it um it transforms you and the magic of it is that you have hope you've hope that we we can come out of this you know we might be able to we might be able to restore um some hope into this crazy crazy world we've built and because nature recovers really really quickly with a bit of support you know and um yeah so that's it and then all the creatures return so you're surrounded by all this magic all the time like you know it's fairly amazing really and almost overnight they come back you know so it's taken off and it's gone over the world and um you know we've 1500 acre arcs in texas or um window boxes in norway or wherever and um yeah, it's a wonderful, we've done it without any money. So um, I've, people have tried to to pull me into that kind of way of doing things, but I decided that it wasn't the right way because I think all those ways of doing things are part of an old world, you know, and we have to build a new one, you know. This world that we have created is not a healthy, balanced world. And, um, and I, think, I think we have to restore our true nature as quickly as we can. So if you want to save the planet, which is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard anybody say, um, you have to start with your own patch of it, really. Mm. That's very true, isn't it? I mean, you have to work on things where you can put your... <clears throat> um, Marie-Louise von Franz, one of Carl Jung's students, said, you know, people still wonder about the so-called problem of evil in the world. And if you want to solve it, you need to start with yourself, your own psyche, right? Where you can get in contact with the problem, not the other person who supposedly is the problem, but re really looking at yourself, and that's not easy to do. There's a funny way in which it's, I, I sometimes say that it's r ridiculous to say we're going to save the planet. And then other times I say, well, if you want to understand the magic that human beings have, just look at the necromancy that we've practiced. We we did wreck the planet in an important sense, not the whole, not that Earth, she'll be here a billion years, maybe. It, it, she'll, it doesn't matter how long to take uh, for her to clean up our mess. She has t the time. But nevertheless, everything that had emerged here, we have transformed. There's a way in which we can say, yes, uh, there is something to be said for the sanity of saying we need to save the, the our home that we did really wreck it and that is our uh, amazing capacity that we have if we wanted proof that we matter in other words because sometimes there's this feeling of helplessness i can't make a difference but we made the mess and even there too there's, uh, there's some philosophical traditions that emphasize hope in the christian tradition it's a it's an important virtue faith hope and charity Buddhist philosophical tradition, and I, I never, I don't know that Plato talked much about it either, um, but uh, it's never mentioned. The idea is that uh, um, what we need is confidence, and that you first find the confidence by seeing other people. So by looking at what you have done, it gives people tremendous confidence. And when you share the stories of the 1,500 acres in the U.S. and the tiny little window box in Norway, people say, wait, this is doable. I don't even have to hope. I actually, I can believe a little bit enough so that I can find it in myself, you know, this this kind of shift. But Joanna Macy, who's a well-known elder in this shift that we were trying to make, the great turning that she, she in turn took that from another writer, but 
she's championed that idea, but she wrote a book called Active Hope because she she too was very influenced by the Buddhist philosophical tradition. She said, all these years I've been doing this active, active, activist work, nuclear proliferation, ecologies, and so on. I never used hope. And she said, but it, it's so important to people. So then she said, I wanted to just modify it and say, active means you have to do something. <laughs> And so that's part of what you're you're saying. Look, if you're feeling, I, I I think this is such an important thing to recognize that when we're feeling like we can't have any impact, simply beginning to do something with the land, so to speak, pick up a shovel when you feel hopeless and you think, oh, this is such a mess. Go get a shovel. Go get some seeds. Go find a way that you actually can put some of your life energy, which the soul hungers for, that feedback, that resonance, that dialogue between our energy and the earth energy, that mutuality. And you're, you're giving people a way to touch that. And what I like about your work too, is that Doug Tallamy uh, uh, came on and he talked about the same idea, which is to give, give back 50% or more if you can. And I think I couldn't tell in one place you said, well, give 50% back kind of like rewilding. And then the other 50%, right? You're saying you could grow food. So you would really yeah. kind of transform all of it. Yeah. So that's even more ambitious, which I like. And when people begin to grow their own food, that can be so transformative. But uh, what's so lovely is that what you were just talking about layers. You talk about, you give people details on how to work with those layers in uh, in your book. And you are addressing a little bit more than Doug Tallamy does the what we could loosely call the spiritual dimension that you're very aware of that dimension and maybe he is too but as a scientist you know you have to be careful what you say so his job is a scientist and that's not your job you're a, a, a philosopher really uh so maybe can you say a little bit about that dimension I mean if we're, it's a, there is this aspect and we were just before we started uh, Mary said what did I say we were going to talk about and and so and I said I, I was thinking of reading it so I, I I pasted it into the into your bio and Mary told me that she said I because I asked is there anything in particular you want to talk about because it's very open usually these dialogues and she said I would like to talk about the nature of reality very philosophical thing magic very philosophical topic and our need to return to our true nature. Now that is a very Zen statement, our true nature or Buddhist philosophy nature or Socratic thing because Socrates, that was his whole point is we're kind of out of attunement. And how do you help in his case, uh, he believed, or Plato seemed to believe that if, if we were healthy, then nature would mirror that. It's, it's kind of what you were saying is that if you look at nature and you see it's degraded, it must be because there's a problem in the human beings living in relationship to it. That was the sort of Plato's view. Um, but maybe, I don't know if, if you don't have to start here, but what I'm trying to open up is this question of the nature of reality and magic and our true nature. And I know that when I, I before reading your book, I watched the movie and th they depicted the scene that you that I then found in your book of you as a little girl and feeling like the magic of the place really had invited you in. I, it, I, maybe if you've told that story too many times and then we'll just tease people and say, go get the book or go watch the movie. It's interesting. And it really happened in, in, in terms of your experience. Um, I don't know, I, but I leave it to you. Can we open up the space of that that part that I think is so important that you're bringing? How would you like to enter it? Whatever you like. <laughs> okay, well, I suppose seeing as you brought up that story, it's kind of, it is kind of an important story for me, you know, and, you know, for anyone who hasn't heard it, I guess it's, it's a nice story. So um, I guess I'll tell it. Yeah, so. Please do. Uh, <laughs> so when I was young, um, I grew up on a farm in the southeast of Ireland and I was the youngest of six children and my parents worked full time and they were farmers. So as well. So they really didn't have much time, you know, and so there was a lot of benign neglect and that was really useful and helpful for me. So I got to be really free, you know, and. Um, I. I remember I used to walk, I used to disappear in the mornings and sure nobody would know if you were there or not. And they'd notice if you weren't there at nighttime, like, but you know, you just did whatever you wanted. And nobody was really interested in me, which is totally fine. Um, but what I mean is they weren't interested in connecting with me. 
they'd had I can, I, now that I'm a parent I can completely understand I have two children and I'm exhausted so the idea of having six and, up, and still giving them attention at that point is like I don't know if I could do it like you know so sorry but that's a bit of an aside but the point is that I made my connections with nature because I didn't make any human connections and so I s- I remember wandering off. I don't have a huge amount of memories from when I was young, but this one is very clear. And I don't remember what age I was. That's the only bit. It could have been six, seven. I don't really know. But I remember my legs were still chubby. So I remember looking down at my legs and I remember what I was wearing. And I remember walking through the meadows and I remember the smell of hawthorn. So I know it was May. And I walked up to the top of the farm and I went into this tiny little field, which had about a four meter gap, you know, just wide enough for my dad's small tractor to get in and out, you know. And I went into the gap anyway, and like it was a small field, it was a meadow, and it was surrounded by a thick, high hedge of gorse and hawthorn, excuse me, blackthorn, all sorts of native plants and you know, a border of, of of lovely kind of wild herbs. And anyway, I went in and suddenly I had a feeling that there was something behind me and I looked behind me and there was n- there was no gap anymore. And the, the 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 gap had disappeared that I had just walked through. And it was very frightening. It was suddenly there was um just the rest of the field looked like the same. There was just three trees and shrubs and Um, thorny bushes and high kind of ditch that they were all growing on and there was no possible way of getting out through it so I wandered around nobody could hear me because I was so far up and I was crying and I could not find my way out and anyway eventually I kind of got distracted by the sunshine and the butterflies and the bees and the meadow and I sat down in the middle of the field and I was just looking at them and then I remember noticing that I was being watched and I looked around to see who was watching me and I realized that it was the plants themselves. They were watching me and they were almost leaning towards me looking for my attention, you know, and uh, that was it like, other than the fact that I noticed that they all had different personalities, but I'd already noticed that about them. But, you know, I was stuck for, stuck there for the day and a neighbor made a noise um at some point later and when i heard the noise i looked around and saw whatever it was was broken and the gap was open again and i went home and i no one was interested so i didn't tell them but i did tell my dad about it when i was 18 and he said the same thing had happened to his grandfather in that field and um he'd been a gardener in one of the old estates and um he was coming home one night through that field and he couldn't get out. He just couldn't get out. He was stuck in it. And it's called a stray sod, like Moncon would know about it. You you interviewed Moncon and Mongon recently. Um, and it was kind of one of those, you know, one of those kind of accepted things in Ireland, just kind of real energy in the land and real energy of other other realities and other beings that we lived with. They've They've all disappeared now. Almost like, you know, um, because they only live in wild places. They don't really live anywhere else, you know. And um, anyway, I had to write my first book because of that film. And I started writing about the, the real story of the film as such, you know, kind of because I wanted to. And then I got bored with that. So I started writing about my work. And that's when I brought myself back to that and started thinking about why why is that always on my mind and why was it important? And I worked it out when I was writing that book. It was basically that when when we started treating the earth like um, something to own rather than something to take care of, it happened when all the religions kind of floated in and among us, you know. Um, like before that, we all lived as as indigenous people do these days still in complete harmony and relationship with nature and an understanding of our place within it, you know, and that heart got smashed into millions of tiny pieces when we started worrying about the next life rather than this one, you know, and um, we could do whatever we wanted here because it was all about the next one, you know? So that's when 
for me, that's when I feel we broke our connection. And, you know, it kind of lingered on in various forms. And, you know, particularly in Ireland, um, you know, we managed to, you know, the, the church here had to kind of integrate different um, traditions and things of ours so that we would go along with what they were doing, you know. But um, every patch of land has its own damage now and it has its own personality and its own spirit it's like it's I don't understand why but that's how I feel about it and when when you're brought into a piece of land it's because you have the same needs as that piece of land itself and and when you when you root yourself into a piece of land the land will work with you to get better as long as you're willing to do the work you know and so all the plants and creatures that call that piece of land their home they now become part of your family and you're part of their family and the worst thing you can do with family or with creatures is to ignore them or to ignore the the, the magical elements of of, of life or to ignore the other beings we, we 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 live with in this planet you know are we we used to exist alongside the you know just the, the veil between us and them was very very thin it's, it's not so thin anymore and um the point being that we we've forgotten that that's you know the nature of reality is that we are magical beings who particular frequencies that have the ability to shift and change and create and um you know there's so much that we have forgotten that really we're just hollow versions of 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 who we can be if we step back into that but it's very difficult for someone to do that without any knowledge or understanding and so there is a process by which you can do that by by healing your own land and what I mean by that is like, just give you an example. My land has serious issues with abandonment and rejection. And I knew that when I got here, it really felt it like, you know, really felt it. Um, but as I've been working with it, it's starting to recover. Like it's starting to, like it loves when I go out walking there now. And it and I can feel that and I love it back, like, you know, and I'm starting to recover because they're the same issues that I have, you know? And so I'm starting to get better. and. There's an old adage that says that all the plants that you need for your own healing grow within 20 feet or 20 meters of your back door or of your bed or where you sleep. And it's amazing to me to watch what comes up around my house. No matter what place I live, you know, psilocybin mushrooms will always turn up immediately. And they shouldn't be growing here because this land was industrially farmed so much like that no mushrooms should have survived. And when I was growing up, I used to collect field mushrooms in this field, you know, because I, I built a house on the farm that my parents, that I grew up on. But um, it was destroyed when I got here, like with fertilizers and chemicals and just overuse and compaction. But it's amazing what's turned up and out of the seed bank because the land is trying to heal itself. And they're the same things that I need to heal. So this is, I'm wandering out in, into all sorts of different areas here in Nico. So I'm sorry if I, I don't even know what you asked me, but I, I've gone off on a tangent. Sorry. We went for a walk into the wild. I think it's, <laughs> uh, these are appropriate things to consider. Yeah. And it's very interesting, this um, idea. Uh, when I spoke with uh, Doug, uh, I, I, it's not that he's the only person who's talked about this, but David Baum brings this up in, in in his own way where he's saying that when you look at the fragmentation of the world that reflects fragmentation in the human psyche now on the one hand you could say that 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 what we did was we went out and fragmented the world because we are fragmented but he he's just suggesting of thinking it a little differently to say that the fragmentation we see in the world is the world's response to our part of a dialogue in which we are speaking in fragmented ways. And if we could begin to come from and toward wholeness, the response from the world would, would be from and toward that wholeness. 
It just speaks to it, what you're talking about, this mutuality yeah. of the wounds and the gifts. It, it, I agree. Um, and I agree that, that we are simply mirrors, reflections of the health of the earth. But my my what I've learned is that it's so difficult for people to put themselves back together, right? But if you're willing to put your land back together, that process happens within you. So you can do it that way or you can do it that way. And yeah. I find it much more easy to put your land back together. For me, it's been much easier than to put myself back together, if you know what I mean. And 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 it was a much easier process because it, it's kind of slightly calmer because you're out there, you're working with the soil, you're working with nature, you're surrounded by support, you're surrounded by by the by the the nature beings, by by energies that you cannot see. You know, we barely can see any of the, the nature of reality with our eyes. You know, and you can feel it though. And just think that 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 all of that is valid. I just don't think we understand our deep connection with the mother body beneath us. Like we just don't realize. Well, well there's the two, I think. See, the wisdom traditions would say, well, it's both. Look at, uh, this is what you just described as essentially what Jung was saying about the alchemists. Mm -hmm. He said, if you really think they're, they were just trying to get rich, you've misunderstood. The issue is you put your psyche into the, that practice. How do you work with your psyche? You can't touch anything in here. It works a lot better if you put it on, okay, so my problems are the lead. How do I take them through this? And you're actually doing this process. And at the same time, that's not the point of it, that the alchemists knew. And that's why they called themselves children of Sophia, children of wisdom. But the wisdom traditions are trying to say, and since they were children of Sophia, they had this too, right? They had a philosophical thing that was quite deliberate. When we were indigenous, we had that too. The myths, the rites, the rituals, the ceremonies, the elders who talked to us and taught us. It was not simply that we interacted with the land, but there was that other part. So it's like the wisdom traditions would say, no, bring the two together because there are things, for instance, if you have compassion practice and you use that compassionate mind to come to the healing of the land, the healing will go better for both of you, would be the suggestion of the wisdom traditions, right? That that's just, that's a tool you wouldn't want to try to live without. You shouldn't, that the healing will be strengthened. That's why I, I even have, I, I put it, I'll link for it with the, uh, the dialogue with Munkin, and I'll put it here too, but there is a, a, a document that anybody who wants it can download it. It's called Practices of a Sacred Place. And these are ways to begin to have practices that are not just the land care, but how do I begin to change the way I use my mind and find out what my mind is? And uh, compassion training isn't in there, but that's always fundamental too, I think. But these, there's a way in which it's both. You're right. If we just try to fix ourselves, that's that's also dualistic. And that doesn't attune with most of the wisdom traditions. Even you could say, and I think it's important to say this, spiritual materialism means we can turn anything into a new problem, into a new way for the ego to hold its ground. And it's not hard to find egotistical permaculturists. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I don't think Bill Molson was very enlightened as a human being necessarily. So how do we, we have to acknowledge that what that word means, spiritual materialism, it means that any idea, any philosophy, any practice, any politics, any ecology, whatever you got, that thing can be turned into a perpetuation and even a deepening and an extending of bondage, structures of power and domination and aggression, even if the intent is liberation. And we can find that with love. We can make rationalizations for doing things that from an objective standpoint, we say, that's not very, how, how could you say that's loving? But we do terrible things in the name of love, in the name of God. It would be very easy to imagine a, a Christianity, which of course some Christians do, that says, since the world was made by the divine, it has to be revered as sacred. Sure, we, we die and something else will happen. But if God made me a sweater, I would cherish it, if, if, you know, as much as if my child knitted me a sweater, you know, because parents put, you know, your child makes a painting, a finger painting, 
at school and it goes on the refrigerator and you love that. My mother saved stuff that I made when I was five, right? You just revere it if you really love your kids sometimes. Of course, every parent has their own way of expressing that, but we could have that view. And there is a way in which I would think there's nothing wrong with imagining other words for the R in art. It could be, of course, uh, rejuvenative acts of kindness, regenerative acts of kindness, but it could also be religious in the sense that religion means reconnecting, religioso, to reconnect with those things you're talking about that we lost. And there's, uh, you know, there's a way, I, I was talking to Jeff Kripo not long ago, who's a kind of well-known scholar of religion here, and he just thinks of religion as, as that branch of human experience, which is explicitly concerned with questions like, why am I here? What's the true nature of reality? What happens to me when I die? What am I supposed to do with my life? Those are, of course, the questions a philosopher would say are philosophical, but he sees religion that way. So anyway, I, I think all these things that you're bringing up are so important. And I just wanted to add this, uh, maybe a slightly shifted perspective on some of them. But I agree, I, I'm not, not in disagreement. It's a very respectful kind of thing I'm saying there. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. So in this uh, process of recovering the sacred and trying to find ourselves, where do you begin? Big question. <laughs> Why not? You can you can make a small one if you want. You can adapt it into a small one, or you can uh, say you can you could say anything if that one's we're not ready for that. No, just where do you begin? I mean, where do you begin? I mean, I guess the thing to explain to you is that I'm not an intellectual. I mean, I I I'm not somebody who will be able to give you all these answers. My 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 um way of being in the world is very simple, and um. My understandings are very simple, so. Well, that's good. There's nothing wrong I, with that. Yeah, but it's yep. you know they're big. They're big questions, and they're probably for someone else to answer. I mean, all I can say is my own experience, and my own experience is um, I do the best I can, you know, and the best I can some days is just getting up and. you know, getting through the day with, 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 with two teenagers and um, trying to make everything keep going. And then other days I have some space and I have some time and there that they are the days that I, I get to delve into magic and delve into um, connecting into land and connecting into water and, you know, sending out you know, I go to the sea and I and I and I'm pretty aware of how much love the sea needs. So I will give it that love and I'll stand in the sea and I'll pull myself under the water and I will I will pull light from below and above me and I'll shoot it out into the sea until I've covered the whole globe with it. That's the sort of thing that I spend my time doing, you know, and it doesn't matter if all of it is made up or not. I don't really care because. I can feel it happening and that's good enough, you know, and, you know, I, I don't, I think, I think if everybody tried to do a little bit of that, we'd, 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 we could, we could shift a lot of consciousness, you know, Indeed. but I don't know where to start. I mean, I think you start where you are, you, you start what, with what you can do. And I guess giving yourself space and time to break, break some patterns in your life would be good. And, not to repeat stories, um, which is always a good one, and <laughs> not hmm. to, you know, to step out of victim mentality, which is really a difficult pattern to break. Um, but I think you know by stepping back into into understanding that you, you know, we're making this all up as we go along here, you know, so. It's a really difficult balance, but it's 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 a difficult balance to 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 ignore what's happening in the world, but yet still care, and oh, yeah. because yeah. I I don't want to contribute to that reality, 
I don't I want to create a new one and I think we're all being dragged into it but it's easy for me to say I'm not living in Palestine you know I'm not I'm not living in Yemen I'm not living in Afghanistan it's it's I I am very blessed in that I I I made a life for myself in somewhere very safe you know I have white skin I'm I'm way ahead of most people in this planet I I have I have resource I have land you know um and I'm grateful for that um and I often wonder how would I manage if I was in a different situation and I I don't know I mean I know on the days where I'm just getting through the day it's not as easy you know it's not as easy like if I had to just survive how would I find time to to try and shift reality you know mm. I guess yeah, they're the what... masters. <laughs> what's that I'm sorry they are the masters the people who can do that oh yeah well I mean look it's what you're pointing at is uh, this is part of how the pattern of insanity perpetuates itself we're all kept too busy and too overwhelmed and so the two things are going together that we don't feel that what we we don't matter and anyway I'm too tired and so usually when when I work with people it doesn't matter if I'm teaching a course or whatever I always will remind them that when we need our spiritual practice most is when we have the most really good reasons why we don't have time for it that's when there really isn't there really isn't time for that walk in the woods there really isn't time for that meditation session i don't have time and that's the pattern at work holding you because it does not want us to find that there is this other dimension of reality that's real because the pattern of insanity is a big delusion you know, we, we can't, this is clearly a delusion the way we've organized ourselves. And the evidence for that comes in this fragmentation and, and degradation that we see that, that biodiversity is falling apart, that ecologies are being degraded, and yet we depend on them. So we're sitting on the limb and sawing it off, and everybody's too busy to stop. So it really does hold us. It's interesting, though, to think in part how much of that insanity is the privilege, the people who do have enough privilege to find the time. And if those people would, would change, the world would just immediately begin to heal. Because what, what we're doing now is we're making this the excuse for why we have to quote unquote develop the rest of the world. Oh, you see, because when people are poor, they don't have time to worry about their ecologies. But those people, before we brought this craziness to them, they lived there for thousands of years and per perfectly fine without destroying it. And so instead of seeing it as the cause, we see what we're bringing to them as the solution. And that's part of the crazy. But I think, you know, all of this is, is important. But I, I, th I think just my question was that you, uh, you, you know uh, how to begin in the sense that your, your book tells people some things to begin with. That, okay, you could recognize, I, I do like what you're saying, that it's so interesting. One time they did this this uh, experiment, and they they uh, brought people in who the, everybody participating wanted to lose weight. And let's assume it was for health reasons that it wasn't you know like it's more of of our, our forcing ourselves on each other. But sure, there can be health issues. So one group was given uh, here's a diet to follow, and the other group was told something really crazy. Um, what we want you to do is something diff different each day you, whatever find the habits of your life and just change one of them so like you could it could be that you take a different way home from work it could be that you uh, uh, eat a, a different food something that you've never eaten before just each day do something that's out of your ordinary pattern and those people lost weight <laughs> there's nothing else there's no other intervention and so there's something very powerful. Sometimes we think, I need to have the new idea or the new insight. Or I, I have to find the, the sacred or way. And what we instead have to do is just begin doing things differently and just make some beginning. And so you invite people to try to listen to the land, try to uh, maybe learn about plants, find out what might have grown there. Um, you, you listening meant, you, is big, right? You meant... You were asking me in relation to the land that question. 
hey, these are the, that's what we were just saying, right? I mean, we, be, we if we want to know where to begin, it's certainly not to try to elect, a, you know, a new president in the U.S. That's <laughs> I, that's not likely to help. I mean, okay. maybe if we could get Cornell West elected, things would change. But I don't think we're, we're going to have probably Trump. So for all of us contemplating that, that's not going to heal the earth. What do we do? Okay, well, I guess, yeah, the first thing to do is to is to let go, you know, and to listen and to spend, just leave the land alone and try and get to know it, like sit out there and look at it and find out which areas are wet, which areas are dry, which areas are um, kind of feel less cared for and, you know, what's missing, what's, you know, just get to know the plants that are there, see if any of them are actually contributing to supporting life or not. Um, and that sort of thing. And then you start to, um, you start to, to develop native plant communities. Now over here, it's a lot easier because we still have a seed bank in the soil, you know, and over there, um, I know there's a lot of non-native invasive seeds in the soil and all of those have to come out. So generally what I ask people to do is to, is to just to remove your lawn, you know, if you have one and you can do that with whatever means you have to block out the light, you know, with layers of cardboard um, or, you know, old wool carpets or whatever you have, just kill off the grass that's there. And um, sorry, grass, but start um, with most murder. It's it's not. <laughs> it right. be not. It's about being a really tough parent, really, to your land, you know, and because that's not going to support any life, you know. And when you've got um, if you've got a kind of a native grass ward, then you're you're away. You're already ahead of the game, you know. But mostly, it's non-native grasses that are planted in those situations. So, so that's the issue, and we should remind people. I mean, the the problem with this is it's an ecological dead zone. It it's might a, look green, like, but it it's effectively an ecological dead zone. And it doesn't look great. It's it's it doesn't look great. It only looks controlled and tidy, and it's a patriarchal kind of beauty which we have to let go of, because the feminine control is a different thing altogether. It's about holding things and allowing them to move themselves. Whereas, you know, we've been told that everything has to look tidy. We've equated tidiness with care, and um, actually, true care is about um, supporting your child, your land as such to develop its own spirit and it's become its true nature, you know? And um, so I suppose it's about getting to know it and seeing what is needed and, you know, adding in layers of, of um, native, native shrubs and the communities that would live around them. And you're lucky over there because you actually have nurseries that grow native plants. We don't, we don't have that over here. So we have to go around collecting seeds from ditches and things, you know, um, to, to bring into our land because you won't you won't be able to buy them, which is just as well because ecologies have adapted locally, you know. And so a plant that might grow in your garden, for example, a native plant will have adapted alongside the, the native insects. And if you bring in a plant that's grown from 25 or 50, 50 miles away, it won't suit the insects that are, are of your place. So it really is, a, it's a difficult balance, but if you can't get one locally, then at least you get it anyway, because it's better than not having one. And the more diverse the community of plants you have and you can create within your space, the more life that will be there. Um, and it, it can still be very beautiful space. It, it doesn't mean it's a mess. You can still, you can use that concept of layers to create spaces for you and your family. You know, you can mow a path through the meadows. You can use dry stones to create edges. You can use dead wood to create dead hedges or, you know, beautiful kind of um, sculptures or um, there's so many amazing things you can do. Um, so you can kind of play with your land by creating spaces within it and creating life, you know? And um, yeah, so that's really the, the beginning. And then the food side is really important because Industrial farming, fishing and forestry is killing everything on the planet, you know, and um, we really have to step outside of those systems because we can't fix any of these systems. We have to create new ones. And the only way we're going to create new ones is to start 
in our local community because all the solutions are going to be local. They're all going to be local. You know, um, you know, electric cars aren't going to save the world, lads, you know. Um, that's an absolute greenwashing solution, which is not a solution at all. You know, if you look at the lithium mine mines and 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 the child labor and the absolute ecological devastation from all of the 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 minerals that are needed to 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 power all these batteries and and on most of the you know over half of the pollution comes from the rubber tires anyway. You know, and so you're just you're just basically supporting the car industry it's not supporting nature you know but people don't know any different because they want to help so they so they do what they can you know and but really what we need is a really cool local uh, public transport system which can be electric because it's not everybody in in an electric vehicle you know and um and uh we can give all these stupid roads back to nature and create parks and you know um bicycle lanes and walkways and you know community gardens where we can grow food and grow wildlife habitats and corridors and you know the world can be such a beautiful place and it really wouldn't take that long you know it really wouldn't take that long but we're not going to be able to solve it by trying to solve it somewhere else the only way we're going to solve it is locally because all the destruction is local to somebody and the solutions can be local as well you know mm -hmm. um so yeah, it's it's about growing food as um, you know, obviously without chemicals, preferably no dig or forest gardens or whatever version of it you can you feel drawn to really. And if you've more than enough land to grow your food in that half, then share the rest of it with friends and family and neighbors who don't have any land to grow food and create communities around growing food and and build communities because as you build the communities of plants and underground mycorrhiza and all those creatures in your land you're going to have to you know you will find your building communities above ground as well because again we're just mirrors of the land you know right well you've got you've got some guidance on creating a lot of people might not have heard of forest gardens the idea here is that you can get something that really is uh, quite wondrous and it take, takes some energy at the beginning, but it really starts to to support you. And I, for a lot of people, that's a that's a strange thought because we have, of course, there's a lot of urban concentration and we've, we've lost the habit. And that's part of it, it's just a habit. You have to stop doing the thing that is not working, which is very hard for us to stop. A and at the same time, have in mind that we want to try to do something different and it's interesting you, you you're talking about beauty and at the same time that too is a concept that has been co-opted by the pattern of insanity because there's a way in which you explicitly reject gardening for beauty as it has been practiced that notion that we're going to make a beautiful garden and but what's your aesthetic sense what, what makes it beautiful and your view is that it's been very contrived, manipulative, controlling, and that there is still the possibility for beauty. And in your book, I know uh, in particular this one too, the garden, the garden awakening. Uh, this has a lot of ways of thinking about beauty, design ideas that you share, so that you people could craft a really beautiful space still, but it might be a forest garden. And it might be partly wild and so on. I don't know. Can you reflect on gardening for beauty versus gardening for guardianship? Sure, I can try. Um, the earth is the embodiment of the feminine energy. And, you know, the feminine energy has been used and abused for far too long. And um, women have had enough of only being valued for being pretty or productive you know and the land is the same and you know we we we, we you know if you take a, a, a kind of a barren piece of land which is generally what a garden is and you know um it's stripped bare it's it's basically like a child that um looks to you its guardian for direction because you, you it knows you have control over what it becomes you know are you going to support it to become its true nature or are you going to shape it into whatever version that you want, you know, for your own pleasure, 
and generally that's what we do um unconsciously we 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 have been trained to um you know just to control the feminine energy to a point where it's just ridiculous like you know it's like it's like it's like a woman covered in in makeup so that you can't see her anymore and um it's like we 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 dress our gardens up in a pink tutu i often say this you know and um you know then if 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 that child starts to grow out of the tutu you know we just punish it like and cut it back and spray it and you know we just say get back into that tutu like you know and smile when the neighbors come around now and don't be trying to change or grow because this is what i've decided is beautiful and there's no conscious understanding of of these these sentient beings that are sharing our space, you know, like plants. People often talk about the horrific cruelty of 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 what we do to the animals these days in order to to eat, and it's beyond horrific what what we do. I I can't even think about it. But um. Nobody con con has a concept of the fact that plants, you know, and I know I was just talking about killing off a lawn. I'm, I'm aware that it's a very difficult reality, but plants are just as conscious. Like we're just we're just plants without roots, you know. We're 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 just like we're we're in our insides are we're missing all the all those connections. Like we've killed off all those connections in our guts, and the same is that the soil has all the bacteria fungi parasites everything that's in the soil in a healthy soil is in our guts if we're well you know we're just turned inside out you know or in on ourselves or whatever it is the everything our whole universe the earth is in our is inside of us that's what that means you know and um i've lost my train of thought now what was i talking about <laughs> oh yeah so <laughs> you got it so, so the idea of beauty is is such a weird thing like but when you when you when you let go and you work with the land to um um it's, it's one of my cats is trying to get in so i'm gonna have to let her in because she's completely no, distracted that's good. yes Sorry. this was the part of the show where i entertain everybody with a magic trick oh no uh, she's she's just looking for attention actually oh, she's hi. fine the other window is open apologies no but that's yeah. okay there you go, the, the, the non-human <laughs> being asking for recognition, because we don't often really know who who lives here. The only who is a human. Yeah. We don't allow the other beings to be a who. We don't realize that there's mind everywhere and that these sentient beings, and there's a human privilege. As I sometimes say that we're so worried about the different kinds of privilege and I, I'm not saying that's not important, but the deeper issue that we, we're all guilty of, that where we can all get together and say, well, this, this is where we need to heal. We're all ignorant, and we all benefit from human privilege, because we can go wherever we want without worry that some species is going to block us from something that we need or desire. And that's, that's not true for any, all the other species have to deal with us, and we're happy to put roads without any thoroughfare for these other beings and we go through their homes and we hit them with our machines and it is this incredible human privilege and then we put so much energy into my life me 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 and those beings are always putting energy into the whole and so this there's a big shift there just to recognize who lives there and to be able to to change what we think of as beautiful yeah yeah, yeah. And There's when a... you come over to my side of the fence or, you know, which you obviously already are on my side of the fence, but when people come, you look back at gardens and, and it's just, it really is like, what was that all about? Like, you know, it really okay. is. I mean, lawns were something that were brought in, in, you know, by the arist arist aristocracy and they basically had enough slaves to go down on their knees with, scissors and shears to cut the grass around the house and you know when the industrial revolution kicked in people in the middle classes wanted wanted to prove that they were just as you know important as the upper classes so they 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 didn't have to use every bit of land they had under their care to grow food so they they, they surrounded their houses with lawns and that's and then the lawnmower came in 
and that was it you know we we started shaving her clothes off everywhere we could you know and importing this crazy colonization just this it's all part of colonization you know we're bringing all these plants from all over the world that don't have a relationship with the food web in that part of the world and we're imposing our energy our view our consciousness our without any understanding that what we're doing is we're destroying ourselves because you know without all these creatures in being in health and abundance then we don't get to live here anymore and that would be an awful pity you know Mm. um that's it really like you know like you say if we if we lose our place on this planet the earth will survive but i'm not willing to give up yet you know and um I think it would not take much for the consciousness to shift for everybody to to come around to understanding that, you know, we have to let go of all this control. We have to let go of this world that we've built because it's no good for anyone. It's no good for anyone. Even the people who are doing really well out of it, it's not good for them either, you know? Mm, no, of course not. And, and here you have, uh, I think this is a word that then needs rehabilitation. We're talking about a hierarchy. We, we as soon as we hear the word we, we want to say no 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 but we, what the word literally means is a sacred ordering there's a sacred ordering that transcends our human agendas and we have to be in attunement with it um patriarchy is a false hierarchy because that's not a sacred ordering and even it's a very difficult and confused term for all sorts of reasons because uh, it, you know of course lots of men have been killed by it but there, there is a sacred ordering that we have to be able to recover and learn. And that somehow changes what we're supposed to do with our life because we currently, unfortunately, you know, you can see in on Turtle Island, there was this I, I, idea and even um, no less a person than uh, our Gaia hypothesis uh, hero, uh, who said that we need to just human beings don't know how to to live with the land we just need to go uh, James Lovelock you know he says just let's live in mega cities and we'll make them as ecological as we can because it's like we we have lost the ability to understand ourselves as integral to the land that we have a job to do you know when I when I see horses because I, I love them in particular so much I mean I love all, all the sentient beings but you know you have special ones you have certain beings on your spiritual totem yeah. who are are your special part of your soul so it's really tragedy to see all these horses in stalls when they know they have a job to do and they go crazy of course you know they start these behaviors these stereotypes the weaving and biting and wind sucking because they're supposed to be out there making prairies and they, this is an important job. They've got to make a prairie. The same way as when people rescue a beaver and they, the beaver, while it's healing, is trying to use the furniture to anything it can. I've got to make a dam. They know they have this job. And we could be the beaver of the world. We could join them. And we could be the horses of the world. And we could join them and work again together. But you have to ask, well, what is this place? What does it need me to make, help it make? And yeah. yes, uh, not only, as you were saying, we might have to do things that the wolves used to do, but we have to learn to live with the wolves again, to say, because I think that's part of what what is disturbing to the soul. It's say, I, I This is a pet peeve, and I've, I've said it before, for those of you who have heard it before, just forgive me, but people will go to the therapist or the so-called mindfulness coach or trainer who does not have any training in the wisdom traditions, and they tell the person, oh, you see, the reason you're anxious is because you're supposed you're on alert all the time and but there there are no wolves you don't have to worry about it so when you realize that you're in your living room and you're safe and there aren't any wolves then you can calm down and i say well how do you know they're not anxious because their soul is saying where the hell are all the wolves i'm supposed to live with them <laughs> you know it's not like i'm terrified that they'll be there i used to know how to live perfectly well with them and we need to bring them back and figure out how to live with them and that just opens up all these interesting challenges because I think part of what you're getting at is that we're not necessarily, uh, in, in terms of that hierarchy, we are projecting, we are the master species, and so therefore our niche is the planet. And maybe the view is what you've been, you've been saying, the word local again and again. I often say, well, 
maybe we have to back away from that and say, no, we cannot be the species whose niche is the whole planet. You're going to have to stay where you live and spend most of your time learning that place and, 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 and letting it learn you. Because what is possible for the place and what is possible for us is mutually arising. We let the place know what's possible for it by letting it know what's possible for us and vice versa, right? Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I always say we have to become the spiders at the center of the web again and reweave it all back together. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I love that. Yeah. Well, there too, isn't it? Because that is Athena's punishment, right? For Arachne, is that she was clever, and she was she was weaving better than anyone else, and her creations were being revered beyond what wisdom thought was appropriate. So she was turned into a spider. And I think that that's it's the same lesson. It's to say. You think that you're so grand for all the things that you make, but a jet airplane is not what we need. A new electric car is not what, what, the, what the world is asking you to make. And you don't get to make whatever you want and say, look how clever I am. And that was what it, that's why wisdom came into Arachne and said, no, it doesn't work that way. It's not, look how, how pretty all the things I made. They have to have a, a real relationship to this hierarchy, to this sacred ordering. Mm-hmm. What else, Mary? What else are you thinking about, you interesting person, you? You're quite the <laughs> philosophical type. See, now this is real philosophy when we're talking about how we really live our life and what is the nature of nature and what is the nature of mind and how do we find that magic again? Not in the woo-woo sense, but the way that Yeats talked about it, where he said, look, this is a world of mag magic and I feel how it's been degraded, he said. you know, I don't want to live in, in the world without it. Yeah. Well, it. I mean, I, I moved into this piece of land, which was degraded, and it was a green desert, you know, Um, and now it, it, it's, it's just amazing if I lie out there or if I stay out there at nighttime and there's bats and owls and dragonflies and um, little tiny little pygmy shrews with little long noses with a bobble at the end. They're the cutest things I've ever seen in my life. And um, it just it's 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 th just woven and thriving with creatures, and if you put up a drone to see where I am, it's quite interesting to see. It truly is an arc, like you know, I'm surrounded mm. by industrial farms, you know, and um, uh, like the, the 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 everybody talks about um getting in touch with nature but it's usually somewhere else you know and they go somewhere to do that and really you can bring it home with you like like doug Tallamy talks about bringing nature home you know but by surrounding if you have if you're lucky enough to have land and you you wrap you wrap your your home and your life with it and you you embrace all the creatures that come to call it their home as well and you spend time out there and you get to know the insects and you get to know plants that come to live there. And, you know, you bring others in and you give them homes. And um, I don't mean creatures, I mean plants. And um, I guess it's just amazing because as you get to know your land and get to know the plants and watch the interactions, you start to see beyond them into a different level of being. Um, which you cannot really get by visiting a place in nature, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you can only get it by forming a relationship with nature. And, mm. you know, like all those people that go off into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights or whatever it is to um, to find that relationship again, they're looking for their true nature, you know? And I'm saying to people, bring it home, like, bring it home because what's the point in, in this world of it's very hard to go off and spend 40 days and 40 nights somewhere and it's very hard to find wild places and it's very hard to 
and we, we shouldn't be looking at it like that like it's not like i think it's uh, we we need to use nature to, to get to a certain point in our in ourselves it's more just that it, sorry that sounded really weird but what i'm trying to say is that like the, the magic of reality is is our true nature and i keep saying that but like if you release the land from the bondages we put it under the, the energies that start to emerge from it are very particular and they they come back very quickly once you once you invite them back you know mm. they, they, they there's a and it's not something i can tell you in words like i could maybe somebody more intellectual could but i can't like it's a feeling and it's a feeling of of recognition of energies that you may not have met since you were a kid. Like when I did the garden at the Chelsea Flower Show, this was just when I was starting. And I was I was a young young woman and um I didn't really know what I was doing yet. I just I had had a dream and the dream was um I had just moved from the city of Dublin back out into the countryside and I was flying in my dream I was a crow and I was flying over Ireland as it was ancient you know and um in in the dream I was flying over ancient woodlands and beautiful pristine rivers and valleys and I, I suddenly heard my name being called in the dream and I I swooped down towards where I could hear it and I went it was in the woods and I went down through the trees and I saw myself painted blue as my human form sitting on a log with a big stick looking up and um kind of grinning at me like with like a cheeky kind of knowing smile and everything just stopped in the dream and I suddenly realized that all this stuff I'd been doing as a garden designer was rubbish like and I really that that nature was the real deal and gardens were just poor versions of that magic that we have access to if we restore it you know and so I, I went to the Chelsea Flower Show and I used I worked with the power of intention because I I put crystals into this very abused piece of land that we were working on for three weeks and I told the crystals what I wanted people to feel when they came here. And so what I wanted them to do was I wanted the, the land to express an understanding of well, I wanted people who came to visit my garden to remember how important and magical wild places were and how we were losing them and we need to look after them and it was really interesting because we created this really kind of wild garden um and it was based around the shapes and patterns of nature and had myths woven into it and you know um communities of kind of plants native irish plants and it was you know, it was a bit Disney-esque at the time, like, you know, but um, but as people came past, they all wanted to come in and visit, you know, they all, and they couldn't because of the way the rules were, but almost everyone that came up to try and talk to me at the gate was crying and they all wanted to tell me a story of, of a place that they remembered from when they were young that had this type of magic and it was gone. And it was amazing to see how that worked, that magical intention that you gave the land was thrown back at you, which is just, you know, it's just consciousness in the land, which is the water in the land, you know? But um, again, then I had another amazing, oh yeah, the, the people that didn't say that to me were generally Irish because there was still loads of magical places back then, but they've been wiped out since, you know, Ireland is now basically a green desert and, and a sheep ranch and, um, you know, there's a lot of really good people here trying really hard to restore it and working really hard to restore it. And, you know, I'm fairly sure we're going to succeed, you know, because people are tired of living in this desert, you know. But then another another dream I had, which was quite interesting, was um, you've probably heard this one because I think it was in that book, the first book. But um, will I tell this story anyway? Are you running out of time? Well, I have time if you do. Do you have time? Okay, I, I have just a little bit of time, and then I have to bring my daughter somewhere. But um, uh, this was a time in my life where I had it was a lot later, and um, I was I was under an awful lot of stress, and um, 
more stress than most people are ever have to it was it was a terrible time and I was on my own with two small children and I was living in the west of Ireland in a very very remote place and um I went to bed one night and I had this dream and in the dream I I woke up in the dream as such and I was in this very very kind of nuclear post-nuclear dark dead landscape and I was at a crossroads and there was roads going in every direction and there was rubbish blowing everywhere and it was cold <clears throat> and windy and I decided to follow this path which was made out of the roots of yew trees and they were all spiraled together and they spiraled away down in, underneath the motorway overpass kind of thing and I followed them down the mo on, in the dark and I got, went under under the the overpass or whatever you call those roads that go above your head I went under the bridge and there was a river and on the, it was a torrential river, like a big wide river. But on the other side of it was this beautiful, pristine Irish landscape. And it was sunny and it was just calm and beautiful. And there was a, there was a, a little dry stone wall um, boundaried field. Um, so there was tree walls that created a square and the river created the other boundary. And as I watched that little field, this kind of vulva shaped flower came out of the center of it. And it grew and grew and grew. And then out of the vulva shaped flower came all these spiraling women of, of all types and all eras. And they were, I knew in the dream that they were my ancestors, you know, and they were, they were, they were kind of, they were, they were screaming. It was like a war cry. They were going to war and, and they were, there was, there was fairies, there was Vikings, there was everything there, you know, from all the way back. And, um, the, the the kind of they were kind of creating a cloud of 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 moving shifting yeah. beings and eventually I couldn't see in the whirlwind they created and then it just stopped and I opened my eyes in the dream and I was standing in that beautiful pristine field and they were all standing together back in the desolate landscape and they'd taken my place because I couldn't I I wasn't going to survive. And I woke up then and I had a huge amount of steel in my back. And from that day forward, I got better, you know, hmm. and that dream led on to me creating what I'm working on now, which is um, a, a really special place, which is like a flagship arc park in the west of Ireland called a place called Westport in County Mayo. And it won't be open until I think 2026. But I designed um, three arcs based around the tree of life concept. And there's the world of spirit and the world of our ancestors. And then just the, the middle realm where we live and breathe. And um, it's, it's completely interwoven with um, myths and ecology and beauty. And it's, it's something that has never been really made in the world before. And it's going to be so magical. And the whole thing is is being restored to an e ecological native plant system and we're working with the land and letting the land lead and decide what's going to grow there and you know we're collecting plants locally from road widening schemes and re rescuing plants and growing them and um it's quite a magical amazing experience like so yeah that'll be that'll be an interesting visit if you ever make it over this way nikos mm. that's marvelous and i i I, I want to say two things very quickly. I, first, this is what Larry Korn wrote. Who's, if you don't know who he is, he's a pretty well-known figure in kind of ecology, gardening in a new way, or you know these these sorts of garden, the gardening awakening spirit. And he said, Mary Reynolds gardens are not only beautiful to look at; they feel different. This is exactly what you were talking about. Walk through one of them, and you are transported to a time when people in nature live together as one family. And uh, he talks about how he says she combines the magic of old Irish ways, sacred patterns and symbols, the power of intention and sound organic management practices to create spaces in which nature can express herself freely and fulfill her own destiny. And he says this book is at once practical, philosophical and spiritual step by step guide. That's the Garden Awakening. And I just wanted to honor what you were saying and uh, that there, there is that image that I mentioned, I think, with Munkin, which is the 
the bodhisattvas coming up from the earth to help us, the awakening beings who are coming up from the earth to help and support us. And the final thought that I just want to leave people with was what you were saying before you told that story about if if we are linked in the way that you've described with nature, then every bit of unbinding, every thread or link of bondage we remove from nature, we remove from ourselves. We're talking about that idea. And so I just want to encourage everybody to really get Mary's book, first of all, go to the ARC website and, and unbind yourself. This is the path of our liberation by creating these spaces of sanctuary and spaces of sanity for ourselves and our kin. And every thread that you cut of bondage, then in its place also a thread of rejuvenation and magic and support will begin to emerge and change you. This is how we change the world. We begin to recover ourselves and find our true nature, but do it with love wisdom. And so I'll say again, I have some practices of a sacred place that you can find here and also compassion practice. Please go with a compassionate mind and stabilize your mind as part of the practice. Mary Reynolds, thank you so much for your work. You marvelous bodhisattva, you, you're such a wonderful person and I really appreciate what you do. Thank you, Nikos. Thanks for listening to me rambling on. <laughs> oh, no, it was, I wish we had twice the time. Thanks to all of you for joining us. If you have any thoughts, reflections, stories to share about anything that we touched on, please send them in through dangerouswisdom.org. We might be able to bring some of them into a future contemplation or a dialogue with Mary. Maybe we can get her back. So write in, tell me all about it, and we'll get Mary to come back and we'll hear more from her. In the meantime, this is Dr. Nikos, your friendly neighborhood soul doctor, reminding you that your soul and the soul of the world are not two things. Take good care of them.